We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing ye islands of the sea. Echo back the ocean caves. Earth shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, saves by his death and endless life Jesus saves Jesus saves sing it softly through the gloom when the heart for mercy craves sing in triumph for the tomb Jesus saves Jesus saves give the winds a mighty voice saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This is our song of victory. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. We did not sing our theme song this, morning, uh, this evening, so let's go ahead and sing that, uh, our theme song, and then we're going to sing In the Garden. Let's go ahead and sing our theme song. Be of good cheer, though the world is shaking. Be of good cheer, never forsaken. One thing we all know, our Lord said, have no fear, be of good cheer. All right, in the garden, let me just look for the number it is, number 271 in the garden, number 271. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still. second. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is raised. On that last, I 
seated. Appreciate everybody being here tonight. I know it's an off night for us, so I especially appreciate your faithfulness tonight and being able to make it happen. Some people, their work schedule, Thursday night's their only open night, and so they can't be here because they had to be at work. So thanks for being here. Rainy weather, but God is still on the throne. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. How many are glad it's not snow? All right. So it's not somebody, how many wish it were snow? Let me say, see, you got the snow lovers there. And that's not because you love snow, it's because you'd be hibernating at your house. And um, anyway, for those that love snow, sorry to disappoint you. But we are here to pray, and prayer is so very important, prayer is so essential, and prayer is our great privilege to be able to go to God and talk to God about what it is that we do need to see Him do and in our lives. Let's be praying for our people who are sick that God will give them grace, God will give them help. Let's be praying for our sportsmen's dinner next Friday evening, and there will be many, many, many unsaved people that will be here that night. And I want you to pray in particular that when Chad Shearer gives the gospel, that it would be uh, super clear, and that there would be, even though it's a fun event, I want you to pray that there would be conviction when it comes to people hearing the gospel that they would see their need for Christ okay so I want you to pray about that how many of you remember to pray for the sportsman's dinner and brother Chad Shearer that when he speaks would you try to remember that put it on your prayer list and that God would help with that and then let's be praying Easter Sunday is going to be here before you know it and a lot of people consider coming to church on Easter Sunday that don't normally come and so be praying Uh, for that, that the Lord would bless that service and that those services that day and that we'd see a great number of souls saved and lives changed. Pray for our missionaries. You've got a prayer list there. Pray for the other things that are on that list. And let's go ahead and talk to the Lord right now, okay? Find a place. Let's talk to God. Pray together. Call unto me and I will answer thee. Show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not.
Father, we thank you that we could be here and pray tonight. And Lord, it's an amazing thing that we get to go and speak with you and that you hear our prayers and that you help us. And Lord, we acknowledge we need your help. Lord, we're weak, but you're strong. And we depend on you. And Lord, as our Father, we pray for your blessing, your mercy, your grace, your help, your supply. Lord, I pray forgive me, forgive us of any pride and not depending on you enough, not praying enough. Lord, sometimes running in our own strength. Forgive us of that, please, Lord. We want to we want to move according to your strength. And God, I pray you forgive us of any spiritual laziness, Lord, any uncleanness. Lord, cleanse us, please. We plead the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we do praise and thank you. So many blessings. Lord, it's amazing how good you are. And Lord, I thank you for people that went out tonight to tell people about Christ and people who have been doing that through the week. Lord, we ask that you give us divine appointments. Lord, I pray you would put us with people that are looking for the gospel, looking for help and hope. And God, I pray you would help our church to be able to see more people saved. Lord, we pray you would use our church as a lighthouse here in Berlin and in Camden County. God, I pray you'd increase my burden for the lost. And I pray you'd increase all of our hearts' burden for the lost. Lord, I pray you'd give us boldness. And Lord, I pray you'd give us opportunity. And God, we pray you give us your power. Lord, I pray for our missionaries all around the world. And Lord, as they minister and as they spread the gospel and build churches, I pray you'd bless them. Lord, I do pray for people that are in difficult places. I pray you watch over them and keep them safe. Lord, please help our sick tonight. I pray for people that are going through chemo and radiation and all of it. Lord, I pray you give them special grace. Lord, I pray for Melanie tonight. I pray you be with her and help her. And God, I pray that you would help people in our church dealing with other illnesses, that you give them grace and healing. And I pray you give our church good health. Lord, I pray you would bless all of our ministries. I pray you'd help the RU ministry. God, I pray you would be with people and give them victory. I pray for our Spanish church. I pray you bless the service tonight. I pray to help Brother Carlos to feel better. And Lord, I pray that you bring more Spanish into Spanish church. Pray for our deaf church. You bless it. Pray for the bus ministry. I pray that we would be able to reach more through the bus ministry. I pray you bless all the young people that are here tonight. And I pray you give us fruit that would remain. Lord, we pray for the sportsman's dinner. I pray that you would bring in everybody that you want here. And Lord, I pray that your presence would be felt in a strong fashion. God, I pray for Brother Chad as he'll give the gospel. I pray you would anoint him, fill him with the Holy Ghost. I pray there'd be great conviction in the hearts of the people that will be here and that many would be saved. Lord, I do pray for our Easter services. Lord, I pray that you give us many people from this region that will come and be part of our services. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to reach the lost. God, I pray you bless our offerings. I pray that you would meet the need. And Lord, I pray you would help us. I pray you give us miracle money to build buildings and do these major projects that we need done. God, I pray for our nation. Lord, we are a mess. We need your help. And Lord, I pray that there'd be a spirit of revival amongst Christians. Lord, I pray that would begin right here in our place. I pray you would do that for us. I pray for Capital Connection. I pray that it would be powerful next week. And I pray that we'd be able to help and reach our politicians with the gospel, our leaders. Lord, I pray that you would work. And I pray you bring the preachers in and other church family members that come. And Lord, I pray you'd be in Pastor Creed and the church there with their planning for this. I pray you would bless Independent Baptist Church. And God, I pray that you would help all of us tonight. Lord, as we hear the preaching and teaching of God's Word, I pray it would stir our hearts. And we love you. We thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus Christ and for our free salvation. And we pray in Christ's precious and holy and wonderful name. Amen.
Well, I hope that you were able to really talk to the Lord and from your heart this evening. If it's your happy birthday week, come on up here. We're going to sing to all the birthday people. Anybody who's it's your birthday week, make your way up here. Here they come. We're going to sing. We're going to sing. years old in double digits. That's pretty amazing. How old are you? 20, 23. 23. I don't know about that. How old, Zach? 16. My soul. Amelia, how old? Man, 23. All these 23-year-olds. Excellent, excellent. Let's sing to them. Ready? Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Give him a hand. Yeah. Trav's on Friday. I don't know what day the others were, but happy birthday to everybody. Eat a lot of cake. There you go. Angela was playing. Miss Bree, bless the Lord. 10,000 reasons. Why don't we stand and sing that before we dismiss? Stay together for now. We'll sing this song. And then we'll uh, dismiss out here tonight. Think about the Lord's blessings. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh your holy name. Found it. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship your holy name. slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near. And my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy.
before Oh my soul I worship your holy name I worship your holy name Great, let's talk about Jesus Deaf church can head out Spanish church, teen church Sing it together Let's talk about Jesus, the King of kings is He, the Lord of lords supreme throughout eternity. The great I am, the way, the truth, the life, the door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. Chorus of all sing the whole verse and chorus oh how i love jesus there is a name i love to hear and i love to sing its word it sounds like music in my ear the sweetest name on earth oh how i love jesus oh seated grab your bible we're in the book of acts tonight appreciate you being here let's learn the word of god that's so essential so important so let's open up our hearts and minds tonight and let god's word speak <clears throat> all right well it's good to see you tonight i know it's a a nasty night out there and we probably have more people live streaming than usual and uh, I am thankful for the live stream. It's a two-edged sword. It's great for people that can't get here, but we don't want you to be a lazy bones either and just stay away. Some people will be here tomorrow night. It always happens that way. And uh, so I'm glad you remembered. I remembered about 12 o'clock today that we're having church tonight. Acts chapter 23. We've been in the book of Acts now. I'm not sure if it's going on two years or three years. But I didn't intend it to be that long. We're now at the end of the book of Acts, and it's a narrative. It's just basically the story of Paul. He has this offering that he wants to bring to Jerusalem, to the saints of Jerusalem, and he collects that offering from the Gentile churches, taking it there. And uh, we found out that from, from this story that they were still... Uh, living under the old, with the old ways, still going to the temple, still keeping the law. And, and uh, Paul goes into the temple and the Jews from Asia go crazy and uh, he gets locked up. And uh, eventually he's going to go to Rome and he's going to be in prison. And that'll, that's where this, the book of Acts ends. But uh, let's look at Acts chapter 23. In verse number eight, it talks about the Sadducees that say there's no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So we see here there's, there's a, a division about what people are believing, and we still have a lot of that today. And uh, different, different groups believe different things. You know, we, we believe the Bible teaches, and I believe this with all my heart, uh, Baptism is uh, immersion in water. And yet we know there's some people and uh, they, they hold to the sprinkling. And so there's, there's different, different, uh, different beliefs there. And I, last week we looked at this. Look at, look at Job with me. The Old Testament uh, teaches a resurrection Job chapter 19. It's not just a New Testament doctrine, okay? Because you remember the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they didn't have a New Testament. So when it was talking about the scriptures, it was talking about strictly the Old Testament scriptures. And all scriptures given by inspiration of God. <clears throat> and in the Old Testament, we call it the Old Testament because we have a New Testament. 
but the resurrection is clearly taught. So just look at it as a way of review. <clears throat> look, at, look at verse 21, has nothing to do with anything. Have pity upon me, have pity upon me, O ye my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. Brother Bish, who's had a lot of issues, I talked to him yesterday, he's had his leg amputated above his knee. He wrote a book, it's, it's called, the title is, When the Hand of God Hurts. The Hand of God Hurts. And, but God recognized, Job recognized that his problems were from God. And so let's get to what we're looking at. Verse 25, he said, I know my Redeemer liveth. So he's prophesying here and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. So Job here is looking forward to the second coming. This isn't talking about the first coming. This is in the latter days and the Lord's going to stand on the earth. And he says, though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. So Job believes here uh, in a resurrection and we believe in a resurrection. Over in, uh, we won't go there, but in Genesis 22, Abraham is going to offer up Isaac. He tells his servants, he says, we're going to go yonder and uh, we're going to worship and then we're going to come back again. And he believed that God was going to resurrect uh, his son, Isaac, from, from the dead. And then Daniel talks about the resurrection. So go back with me to Acts 23. I'm going to try to skip through some of this. And uh, verse number 10. Well, look at verse number nine. I can't get away from some of this stuff. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, notice what he says, let us not fight against God. Let us not fight against God. The last thing you ever want to do is fight against God. We don't want to do that. We, um, when we got saved, we were in a church and there was division in the church. The, uh, the new pastor had come in and for a while, everybody liked it and things were happening. But then too much was happening and the people that had originally been there in the church were losing control of the church and it was all about control. So they started being against everything that the pastor was for. And this is how churches end up having splits and things and uh, when, when different groups get different ideas. But you need to make sure that you don't fight against the Lord. You don't fight against God. Remember Gamaliel said that when they, when they arrested the apostles. He said, let them, let them go. He said, if, it, if it's not of God, it's not going to go anywhere. If, if God's not in it, nothing, it isn't going to happen anyway. But if God is in it, you don't want to be fighting against God. So that's just some advice from from me, really, I, it's scripture, but there's different things going on in Christianity, in independent Baptist circles, and there's a lot of stuff I just don't touch. I'm just not going to get in it. It seems like a lot of times when a person will have a bigger ministry, other people all of a sudden start attacking that person. And the truth of the matter is, I think a lot of times it's just about jealousy. And when you're attacking a pastor, you're attacking a church or a ministry, you're, you're attacking God. Remember Jesus, he, he said to uh, Saul, he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So Saul was persecuting the Christians. He was persecuting the church. But actually, he was persecuting the Lord. So we don't want to fight against the work of God. We don't want to be critical and negative and, and making comments we shouldn't make. So there arose, verse 10, a great dissension. The chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, 
Command the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the castle. Now, this is Antonio's fortress. It was a barracks there where the Roman soldiers would stay. And it was right there by the Temple Mount because that was always the place of trouble. And that's where the trouble is today. They still have people go up on the Temple Mount and uh, the Muslims go crazy and it's just a place of contention. And look at verse number 11. The night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified to me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also of, uh, at Rome. So here's the Lord, and Paul is, I'm sure, you know, I mean, he's, he's human just like we are. And he, he's, everybody's against him. They're trying to kill him. And soldiers have basically uh, put him in, in jail. He's under arrest there. And I believe he's at a low point. I believe he's at a, a down place in his life. And the Lord comes and encourages him just when he needs it the most. Now, don't expect the Lord to be standing in your bedroom in the middle of the night, or don't expect you know, to see the Lord physically. But I believe this. I believe there's times in everybody's life, and I hope you go back on some of these times, when, when you were down and yet somehow the Lord encouraged you. He might not have done it personally, but he did it through people. He might have done it through some music or a song, but the Lord was there to encourage you. Uh, my great, my great, not my great, my granddaughter Kayla is married to Cameron Manorese. And the Manorese family, their dad has a church down in Delaware. And Mackenzie, one of his sisters, was in the hospital and started playing what one of our songs, Brother Charlie, were they playing? You are God alone. You are God alone. And that song, God used that song to encourage her. And that's how we met the Manorese's, and now they're in the family. But God, listen, God will encourage you. Hold your finger here. We'll come right back. But look over in Acts chapter number 27. Acts chapter number 27. Paul is on a ship that's going down. I can't imagine how terrifying that must be when a ship is sinking. Um, the Ukrainians just sunk a Russian ship over there in the Black Sea. And he's on this ship. And look at verse 25. He said, Wherefore, sirs, be a good cheer. I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. And look back at verse 23, what he's talking about. There stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. So the Lord does the same thing in Acts chapter 27 that he does in Acts chapter 23. When, when Paul is in this situation, the Lord encourages him. And the Lord stands by him and the Lord, the Lord is there for him. I like Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord. Now look back at verse chapter 23, verse 11 again. The night following, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer. And that is our theme this year, be of, be of good cheer. And it doesn't just mean be happy. It doesn't mean just, you know, smile. But it means to be, when he says be of good cheer, it's the same as saying be of good courage. Be of, be of good courage. Cheer, cheer up, be of good courage. Be strong. I'm with you. I'm going to take care of you. Amen. I'm going to get you through this. So in these evil days, we need to be of good cheer. Amen. We, we, there's so much going on in this world that, that could, it could scare you to death. I mean, the, the whole culture, the whole political scene, uh, just seems like everything's upside down. The time has come. It's actually come when they call good evil and evil good. It's here. I mean, when I started preaching, I'd read those verses and I think, boy, if that ever happens, that's going to be a bad thing. Well, guess what? 
I mean, it's going on right now in front of our eyes. People that are trying to do right are being called wrong and people that are just the worst people in the world are, are heroes. So the Lord told Paul to be a good cheer and he's telling us the same thing. Be a good cheer. And just like he was there for Paul, he's here for us. Notice something else about this. Very simple, but very important. He said, be a good cheer, Paul. As thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou also bear witness also at Rome. So there's two things here. Number one, Paul is a witness. Paul is a witness, and we're supposed to be witnesses. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, uh, the Bible says, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you should be witnesses unto me. And we are supposed to be witnesses. But notice something also. Paul was encouraged by the fact that he was going to make it to Rome, that these people were not going to kill him. He was going to get through this because here's the Lord and he says, be of good cheer because you're going to be my witness in Rome. So just like Abraham, God had promised him that uh, Isaac was going to be blessed and his seed was going to pass through Isaac. Now Paul knows that he's going to be in Rome and somehow God's going to get him through this hard time. So we'll probably never be to Rome but we will be in heaven one day if we're saved and that should be an encouragement to us. No matter what goes on here, we have a home in heaven. Whatever, whatever is going on here, the Lord's going to straighten out. And it was day, certain of the Jews banded together, bound themselves under a curse, saying they would neither eat nor drink till they killed Paul. So they must have got pretty hungry because they never did get Paul. And the Lord didn't allow that to happen. So look at verse 16. When Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. So here we see that Paul had family. It doesn't say his sister was saved, doesn't say she wasn't saved, but he has at least that much family. He has a sister, and he has a nephew. His sister's son heard of their lying in wait and went and entered into the castle and, and told Paul. Now look at Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter number 16. He says in verse 7, in, in Romans 16, the end of the book of Romans, Paul is giving greetings to people. He's calling them out. He's giving them a shout out. And among all these people, in verse 7, he says, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. So here are these two people, and Paul calls him, uh, calls them his kinsmen. Now, does that mean they're family? You know, we don't use that word much, our kinfolk. That's kind of like a, you'd think of Kentucky or something, kinfolk. But the idea of kin is the idea of relatives. But look what he says over in Romans chapter 9. I say the truth in Christ, Romans 9, 1. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now he's talking about Jews here. So he's calling the Jews his brethren, and there is not his spiritual brethren, but there is physical brethren, and he calls them his kinsmen. So we don't know if these people are actually relatives or they're Jews, because he does call the Jews his kinsmen. Go back over there, Romans chapter 16. Look at verse 7. 
Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners. They're in jail. They're locked up for the faith who have note among the apostles. And then notice what he says, who also were in Christ before me. Now, what is he saying there? He's saying that they were saved before he was. Because when you get saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. All right? So what does that mean? That means that they were saved before he was. They were in Christ before he was. Look at the verse, because this is super important. I'm not, I'm not stretching anything here. I'm not twisting anything. He talks about these two people that were in Christ before him. Now, look over in Ephesians chapter number one. Ephesians chapter number one. And look at verse number four. According as he has chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Nobody was saved before the foundation of the world. Nobody was saved then. Nobody was actually in Christ, but God had foreknowledge and knew who would be in Christ. But he also determined, he decreed, that it was the people in Christ that would be the saved ones. Look at the verse. According as he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. So God saves everyone that trusts Christ, everyone that's in Christ. If everybody was in Christ before the foundation of the world, these people could not have been in Christ before Paul. Does that make any sense to you? We're talking about hyper-Calvinism because hyper-Calvinists believe, you know, all the ones that were predestined, all the elect were already saved before the foundation of the world. That's, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you get saved when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So it explains the fact the in Christ is the important part here. According as has chosen us, not before the foundation of the world, but in Christ before the foundation of the world. He said, anybody that's in Christ is going to be saved. Before the foundation of the world, he decided that. So go back with me to Romans chapter number 16. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. I'm in Romans. What's the matter with me? Go back to Acts. I hope you're already back there. Acts chapter 23, all right? Um, verse 16 talks about Paul's sister's son. Remember, Peter had a mother-in-law. So if he had a mother-in-law and didn't have a wife, he was pretty dumb. So we don't see a lot about these, these, the family of these people, but they had family. So... They're going, to, they're going to lay in wait and they're going to try and kill Paul. There's 40 of them. But look at verse 23. He called unto him two centurions. This is the chief captain. Make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea. Horsemen three score and 10, spearmen 200 at the third hour of the night. So they got 470 soldiers. They're not messing around. They're taking the threat seriously. These 40 zealots, these 40 fanatics, if they attack those 470 Roman soldiers, they're going to be in bad shape. But they're not taking any chances. Look at verse 31. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. So they went about halfway to Caesarea, about 40 miles. And then uh, they, most of them returned to the castle and they figured they were safe at that point. So go down to chapter 24. And after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders with a certain order named uh, Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. So here come the big wigs. Uh, 
Ananias here, he's got his robes on and his Dagon, the fish god hat. He's got his shepherd's staff. Ananias was a very corrupt high priest. He ended up getting assassinated. And, uh, you know, a lot of times there's very carnal people in spiritual places, in spiritual positions. You with me on that? Um, somebody might hold an office that seems very prestigious or very religious. Same way in politics. When we start looking at Festus and Felix and Agrippa, these are all corrupt people and they're in positions of power. And even today, listen, this holds true. 2,000 years later, we're, we're still looking at the same thing. There's a lot of people who do not deserve to be in political offices, and, and we can see that all over the country, some of the junk that's going on. I believe it's more uh, prevalent today than, than it's ever been, where you see people that do, shouldn't be in that position. And, uh, you know, Lord knows all about it. Like I said, here's Ananias. He ends up getting assassinated. And then his son gets assassinated. So they come down there and um, Tertullus, he's, he's a lawyer. He's, uh, he's an orator. So they, they bring him down and he's going to butter up uh, Felix. So look at verse three. We accepted always in all places most noble Felix with all thankfulness. Now, Felix didn't last very long. He was a very corrupt, very hard person, and there was a lot of rebellion going on, um, a lot of things happening, and so they just got rid of him. They, they recalled him. But notice verse 5. He said, we have found this man. This is this orator, and this man he's talking about is Paul, the apostle, a pestilent fellow. He's, you know what they're saying? He's a pest. And you know what a lot of people think about you? The same thing. They think because you're bothering them, you're always trying to witness to them. You know, uh, I'm, I'm thankful for all the public relations we can have with the town and Winslow and Berlin and all these. But the truth of the matter is the world loves its own. And Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. So don't think the world, the lost people uh, are going to love you. They're not. The more you're like Christ, the less they're going to like you. So look at verse 5 again, 24-5. We have found this man a pestilent fellow. This guy's a pest. We like to get rid of him. A mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, the sect of the Nazarenes. What are they talking about there? They're talking about Christians. They're talking about Christians. Look at Matthew chapter two and verse 23. The Bible said he came and dwelt and this is, this is after they've come back from Egypt they, he, Jesus is born in Bethlehem, according to Micah, the prophet, and that prophecy was fulfilled. Then they go down to Egypt, so to protect him, because you remember all the babies two years old and younger are all killed. And then they come back and they settle in Nazareth that the scripture could be fulfilled. And uh, verse 23, he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he should be called a Nazarene. So here we see these people, these uh, Pharisees and these Sadducees, they're, they're calling the Christians the sect of the Nazarenes. So Christianity is not at this point yet established itself as a separate religion. But they're, they're looking at it like a, you know, a, a group. So look at Paul. And again, I'm trying to skip through here. He's, he's witnessing and he's testifying. And he's talking about how he was innocent. Look at verse 14. He said, this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. 
believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So Paul says, these people are, are calling me a heretic. And uh, he said, I know what they think of me. They think I'm a heretic. But he says, I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things are written in the law and in the prophets. Now, what is a heresy? What is, what is a heretic? A heretic is a false teacher. And a heresy is a false doctrine. You need to know, we need to know doctrine. We need to know what the Bible teaches. That's why we have Sunday school. That's why we have Bible teaching on, on Thursday night. It's not that we, we, don't, we don't love preaching. We love preaching, but we need to know what the Bible teaches. So we don't want to be heretics. Look at Titus chapter number three. Titus chapter 3, and look at verse 10. A man that is a heretic, a man that's a false teacher teaching false doctrine. I said this in one of my classes this week. The heresy that's nearest the truth is the most dangerous heresy. When people have, I shouldn't say people have, but Rat poison is 90% grain and 10% poison. It's the 10% poison that kills the rats. But if you made it 100% poison, the rats wouldn't eat it. So a heretic isn't somebody that teaches just everything wrong. It's a person that will agree with you on, on a lot of things, a lot of different points, but then there's something in there that they believe that is contrary to the word of God. And what's amazing to me is how many Christians, truly born again Christians, sincere people, people love God, don't know enough Bible that they fall for the heresy. I remember I was reading a book by John MacArthur and it was talking about the woman of the well, and here's what it said. And she came face to face with God's irresistible grace. And I read that, and then all of a sudden I put the brakes on, and I backed up, and I said, what irresistible grace? There is no irresistible grace. Stephen said, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. So much for irresistible grace. As your fathers did, so do ye. So look at the verse with me. He says, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition. In other words, you, can, you, you just don't you know, cut somebody off. You, you ask them about it. You question them about it. You talk to them about it. And if they're going to persist, then, then there has to be uh, a rejection here. And whatever, whatever that, if you're in a church, um, you, you just can't allow people to come into church and spread false doctrine. Let me, let me give you the one that's on my mind tonight. And I already talked about the idea of hyper-Calvinism and their unconditional election. But I, I believe right, right now, I would say there's two things that are really destroying and hurting and changing Christianity in our country and churches. And number one is the idea of, I would call it a cheap grace, where because you're under grace, you can just live any old way you want to live. Look at, look at that verse with me that I've showed you so many times. Look back in Galatians with me. Mikey, you keep track? 801. Oh, you're good. I know who to count on right here. <laughs> I told Mikey, wave at me when it's 8 o'clock. He just said it's 801. 
Look at Galatians chapter 5 very quickly, please. Galatians 5, 13. Brethren, you've been called into liberty. We have soul liberty. We have Christian liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. An excuse to sin. But by love, serve one another. So that's, a peop that's exactly what people are doing. They're using grace, they're using their liberty as an occasion for the flesh. Anybody that has any standards, keeps any rules, that person's a, a legalist. So the second thing that is really hurting, I believe today, killing churches is hyper-Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinism. The Southern Baptists are eating up with it. The GARB, General Association of Radical Baptists, They've, they've, it's totally, totally, they're gone as far as hyper -cap. And I believe out of all the five points of Calvin, the one that's the biggest heresy of all is limited atonement. Limited atonement. Limited atonement is that they believe that Christ only died for the elect. That the, the, uh, the atonement isn't sufficient for everybody. What you're doing there is you're, you're limiting the, the, the work of Christ. You're, you're saying that, that it, it's not what it is. You're, you're minimizing uh, the, what Christ did. Look with me over in, uh, and we're going to close. We've looked at this many times, and I hope you know what I'm talking about. But look at 1 John chapter 2. I've said this to people, and I mean it. I believe I could get up on Sunday morning and preach heresy, and people would say amen. Because we're that Bible illiterate. 1 John chapter number 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He ever liveth to make intercession. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Jesus came as a prophet. He ascended as a priest. He's coming back as king. Then notice the next verse, and this is what I want to get to. He is the propitiation, a satisfactory payment. It's satisfied. God, listen, when Christ died on the cross, he had to satisfy the righteousness of God. Did you ever think about that? People have this idea, you know, he, he died for the, because of the devil. He didn't die because of the devil. The, the payment, the, the redemption, the precious blood had to satisfy God's righteousness. Amen. It had to be a sufficient payment for our sin. So notice this. He is a propitiation, the satisfactory payment for our sins. And he's talking about saved people here. And then he says this. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, I'm not going to go any further and get into other verses, but we go over all kinds of verses. Hebrews 2.9, he test, tasted death for every man. So when Jesus died on the cross, listen to this. You want to hear something that sounds like heresy. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't save anybody. But he made it possible for everybody to be saved. But everybody's not going to be saved. That's universalism. The ones that aren't saved aren't saved because they couldn't be saved. They aren't saved because they wouldn't be saved. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that come up to me, unto me. How often would I gather you like a hen gathers her chicks? And then he said this, you would not. You would not. Look at one first, John chapter five. This is so important that you get this straight. We, we just had a person, went to our Christian school. I don't think graduated from here. Got a scholarship at the summit. Went through Bible college at a church up in New England, just got all tangled up in hyper-Calvinism and uh, 
how do you say it? He, he gave up his church. What word do I want? Not retire. Resign. He resigned. Brother Chow is my brain down here. He says, uh, look at John chapter number five. Search the scriptures, verse 39. That's what we're doing tonight. In them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. He says, and you will not come to me that you might have life. You will not come to me that you might have life. He doesn't say you can't come to me. If you believe in election the way hyper do, they, they, don't, they don't believe, if you're not one of the elect, they don't believe you can be saved. And their idea of the elect is the ones that have been uh, predestined before the foundation of the world. And we already looked at that. So I hope you're saved. If you're not, you need to get saved. It's not his will. Listen, it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You're one of the any and you're one of the all. If you're not saved, it's not God's fault, it's your fault. So you need to do it. Let's stand. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to study the word of God. We need to read the Bible. We need to know what it teaches. Angela, you play something. If you're here tonight and you want to pray, come down the altar. If you're not saved, Brother Jason's standing here. Rebecca's here. If you're not sure you're saved, make sure tonight. Nail it down. You need to get serious about the Word of God. Understanding the Scriptures. Asking God to help you and show you and teach you. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. I'm standing here, but it's God that shows us. It's God that teaches us. It's the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, guides us into all truth. All truth. If you don't know that if you were to die that you go straight to heaven and for a Bible reason, why don't you come and get saved right now? If you're a man, come to where Brother Jason is on my left. If you're a lady, come to where Rebecca is on my right. Privately and off to the side, they'll take their Bible and they'll show you from the Bible how you could receive Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior. Would you come and be saved if you're not saved? If you are saved, we need to study the Bible. We need to learn it. There's always more to learn. The Bible is inexhaustible. How much time are we spending in the Word? Lord, I pray that you would help me. I pray you'd help all of us. Lord, we want to learn the Bible and know the truth. And I pray you'd help us to do that. We do thank you for free salvation. And God, I pray you'd burden all of our hearts about sharing the gospel with a lost world. And that you would help us at our church to see many more come to Christ. And God, I pray, bless Pastor Clark for his 
study and for his teaching us tonight. I pray be with all of the people that are here and that you bless us and help us. And we love you and praise you. We pray you help our sick and give them grace. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. I maybe got some help or learned something tonight, one or the other. Did you got to get some help or learn something? Good. Thank the Lord for that. And I appreciate the Bible. We had some young people tonight at Rowan University. Wednesday night is the night that they meet, and they had their church service there because we invite the students at the university to attend. And so uh, Damon was there and some others. And so that's good. I want you to pray about that. We need to get, we need to get it started in all the local universities. And I want you to pray that God will give us uh, a great harvest of souls. I appreciate we have new students, uh, new people in our church that are students at Rowan that have been coming more faithfully. And you just pray that the Lord would just do something there and really just uh, start that, have that spread across the campus, and that would be a great thing. If you're struggling with addictions or stubborn habits, we have a Bible-based program called RU, Reformers Unanimous. Brother Joel Patterson standing there in the back. He'll be at the Welcome Center right after the service. They meet on Friday night. And also on Sunday morning. And if you are in need of help, please see Brother Joel at the Welcome Center right after the service. We have our church young people, 7th through 12th graders, participating in the Faith Tournament. If you're wanting to go watch any of it, Faith Baptist Church, Fairless Hills, Pennsylvania. If you put that in your GPS, it'll pull it up, Wistar Road. And that's where it's at. And Faith Baptist Church, Fairless Hills. So our young people... Uh, we'll be competing tomorrow and then on Friday and then hopefully on Saturday because that's when the championship games are and we like to be in those. So text SRCS Sports, SRCS Sports to 97000 to receive updates. All right, SRCS Sports to 97000. Wear your maroon, silver, and white, and come cheer on the young people. It'll be a great time. Anyone who pre-ordered the Long Sleeve Swordsman t-shirts, they are available at the Welcome Center right after the service. We do have a few extras if you'd like to purchase. Uh, Abby Smith will be there at the Welcome Center, and you can see her. So pick it up if you ordered it, and we have some extras. This Sportsman's Dinner, coming up quickly, a week from this coming Friday, and good number of folks have signed up already. If you have not and you're planning to attend or if you're signed up and now you're going to bring someone with you in order to help us prepare, would you please sign up just as soon as possible, which means before you leave the building. Get signed up tonight and we would really appreciate that happening. All right, we're going to close in prayer. Sir. Yes, sir. I'm going to, I'll announce it now, but I want to wait until the kids are in here that participated in it. Um, don't think we were able to get the, uh, the Did we put that on Solid Rock? In, Brother Brad, where are you? Um, our young people from the Christian school won first place in the orchestra yesterday, orchestra competition at um, <laughs> Garden State Association of Christian Schools. We'll put their rendition there. Uh, let me recheck on that before I put that anywhere. I know you can listen to it, but I, we may or not want everybody to listen to it yet. If they're playing it for the spring concert here, they may be saving that. Or is that all right? I, I'm, I'm, I know you heard it, but that doesn't mean everybody heard it yet. All right? I'm... I'm, I'm uh, I'm not getting myself in trouble with the people that are leading in all that, all right? So we're going to find out what's going on on there. You all right with that? Or are you going to? All right, good. <laughs> Let's sing. Read your Bible every day, praying as you read it. It will guide you all the way if you'll only heed it. In my heart, in my heart, 
send a great revival. Teach me how to watch and pray and to read my Bible. How many of you have never sung that before? Let me see your hand. Oh, a whole bunch of you. I don't know if we have words for it or not. Let's try it one more time. I'm going to take it up just a notch, I think. Read your Bible every day, praying as you read it. It will guide you all the way if you'll only heed it. In my heart, in my heart, send a great revival. Teach me how to watch and pray and to read my Bible. You're dismissed. God bless you. Thanks for being in church tonight.